Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Ed Ott's lifelong work has been in the labor movement. He started almost 40 years ago as a union organizer, and now he's a distinguished lecturer, I love that title, in labor studies here at CUNY Graduate Center. He's also a very skilled political being who's led many successful legislative campaigns to improve the lives of working people. And he's the guest today. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. I grew up not in a union family, but a family that had great respect for the unions. And I remember all these different strikes and all the person of people. And it just seemed to me that it was the most exciting romantic thing around somehow. But I don't f know if kids growing up now have that. I don't think they have that same feeling. Well, you know, it's funny because uh, conversations at dinner tables can shape your lives. And I grew up in a working class family. My mother was a retail clerk and then later on became a hospital uh, administrative employee for the city. Uh, and the union was part of her life. Uh, you had a problem, you went to the union, they mm -hmm. took care of your health care, uh, whatever happened during the fights when they were trying to close what was then Fordham Hospital. You know, Robert Kennedy comes down and uh, leads the picket line, and my mother, who was quite conservative and had never walked a picket line in her life, okay. puts on a red dress and gets out there <laughs> and starts raising the heck. Uh, th those things leave certain impressions. And uh, but I went to work as a young kid uh, yeah. in the supermarkets. Yeah. The union was there, uh, clearly a presence. Uh, so yeah, it, it's. I think it's different in certain ways. Uh, the other thing that's really different. In a city like this, where it was an industrial-based manufacturing think, trade yeah. union movement, uh, there was much more conflict. Uh, industrial strife was mm -hmm. more of a, uh, a daily occurrence in people's lives, mm -hmm. and workers learned different skills. Uh, as we've become more white-collar, more public sector, unions learn skills of litigation, lobbying, uh, politics. The conversation is different. Do, are more are more white collar jobs are now in the union too, isn't it? True? Well, because of the public sector yeah. largely, yeah. Um, and, and certainly in the hospital system where they started right. out with the service, what they used to call the service unit, yeah. and then they went and they went all over the clerical and administrative employees, nurses, everybody started organizing. Who were the union leaders in, during the Vietnam War? They were so involved in everything. I mean, uh, Gottbaum was at. Uh, well, uh, Gottbaum was at 37. Feinstein was at the Teamsters. Right. But you know, you also had guys on the more moderate Stop side. Peter, Peter Brennan was, you know, head right. of the building trades in the city and became the the uh, Secretary of Labor for Nixon, and and helps pass the OSHA yeah. Act. Yeah. These guys were all very part involved. Of it. Yeah. Yeah. It was, but I don't see these guys as involved these days. I don't know why. Well, you know, I, I well, again. Maybe it's because I'm not as Again, involved. you know, the density of the labor movement nationally is very different. We've lost, yeah. in, in the country, we've lost millions of manufactured industrial jobs. The city's completely changed its economy. So the sectors that grew, sectors like finance, real estate, banking, were not traditionally unionized sectors. So are they becoming, becoming objectives to get into a unionized? Well, you, you know, there's some small activity on Wall Street of. Uh, one of the uh, office and professional employees has some members on Wall Street. But in general, no, the growth has been in the public sector and in this town in the nonprofit sector, uh, in the hospitals, uh, some of the other support organizations that are advocates for the poor. Uh, they've organized over the last uh, two decades. Uh, so uh, the numbers actually mask some of the changes. Ch globalization, is that what right. you talk about? La labor, labor is words. still very powerful in this yeah. city, but it's a different kind of power. Yeah. And it's almost, I mean, so you have to readjust ha what you're doing, don't you? You have to, you know, I think it's been a major readjustment. I mean, I start out uh, in really in, in many ways with organizing in uh, hospital workers. Then I spent a period of time in industrial unions, oil, chemical, and atomic workers. Uh, those shops aren't even here anymore. Yeah. So I, I transitioned with the economy in, into the white collar public sector right. unions. Y you were with the Central Trades Council. I was with the Central Labor Council. The yeah. Central Labor for Council for thirteen years. And and the Central Labor Council is consisting it consists of what? Well, it, it's Trade? basically the official arm of the AFL-CIO in New York, but it includes all of the unions, including what's called the Change to Win unions. Uh, it's the coalition and coordinating body of all the unions in the city. So we've got two uh, coalition groups or overall groups. One is uh, the AFL-CIO and the other is the Change to Win group. Right. And the Change to Win came out of the AFL-CIO. Right. And it, it's got how many unions now? I mean, it's got... 
Well, they, they started with seven, and then the Carpenters are kind of completely independent on their own. They're not in either one. They're not in either one at this point. So this is Unite, S-E-I-U? Uh, uh, yeah, it was uh, H-E-R-E, S-E-I-U. -E at the -E time it was uh, Hotel Workers, oh, right. Hotel and Restaurant. Right. Then Hotel and the Garment Union created Unite Here. Right. Um, now they've separated. Um, ah. So, and then you had the farm workers, United Food and Commercial Workers, retail uh, distributive right. workers, uh, and that became the change to win. And, and, and you know, the discussion was about how to go forward, how much to put resources into organizing, how much to put into politics legislation. Um, but, but they as, don't as differ a in their matter, legislative goals. No, do and they? on a practical yeah. matter, on a, on a local level, uh, it stayed together, mm. uh, and there was a lot of uh, pressure at the base of the union movement not to have a split on a local level. And, and, and the unions, of course, are very powerful in elections because of not only money but manpower, right. people power. Um, what happens now in something like the health care bill with the unions? I mean, where are we with that? Well, you know, in, in my <laughs> I start my experience in the labor movement 40 years ago. Um, we've been discussing health care reform since the day I got Start. involved. Yeah. Uh, I can remember in the early 70s going to a meeting of a group called the Medical Committee for Human Rights as a young union radical, um, and the discussion was on a bill uh, for single-payer health care, which I had no understanding of what it was. Um, and at that time, the labor movement was very divided on the question. Uh, with some of your big industrial unions, like United Auto Workers, not too interested. They had very good benefit plans. Mm -hmm. um, and I've watched over 40 years people move mm -hmm. all around this. During the Clinton years, uh, mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton led a big fight for national health care. Uh, we split six ways against the middle on that one, uh, depending on where you the fell. The success of a union to negotiate the contract. Right. But now that you know, the problem lot, with, The problem that with health care is not the people without it. Right. It's the people the with it. it. They're terrified if you have of too change. Too good a trip, you don't want yeah. a, a program. But also now, the more more negotiations, re you know, of labor contracts, aren't they really negotiating around health plans? Part well, of it's it? a huge it's an cost item. Thing. Every negotiation. Right. Uh, I remember uh, the head of the Transport Workers Union here after his first negotiations when Roger Toussaint got elected, uh, coming and talking to the labor movement afterwards and saying he could feel the pressure of the, his members to give up everything else they had in order to keep health care. Mm -hmm. uh, and as your workforce gets older, it uh, becomes a much more important issue. How do you carry this kind of coverage into retirement? That's the kinds of things I think working people want solved and employers want solved. Yeah. So the larger you, the union, can we say most likely the better their health benefits? Um, well, yeah, as a general rule, you yeah. could say that. but. You know, if you think about it, as, as the private sector changes, uh, average wage in this city has descended towards, n uh, private sector wage, towards 9.90 an hour. Um, some of the public sector uh, standards in health care are going to come under increasing pressure as that tax base gets smaller and mm -hmm. smaller. And, you know, in my view, the wealthy don't pay enough taxes in this state, uh, certainly in corporate any taxes. Place. Or <laughs> any place, to, to be fair. So uh, let's see how long that holds. And I think that's a real issue in the next few years. You did a lot of work in Albany. I did a lot of work in Albany. What were the major issues you worked on? Well, when I, when I was up there, I mean, it started with, uh, you know, a workers' comp reform, which hung around for 12 years before we were able to do anything. I remember early on, one of the first fights was toxic torts. And then there was what we always called the toxic bud. Torts toxic torts was a reform, uh, third party pay us suits. Yeah. Um, and then it was always what we used to call the budget follies. Uh, it seems like, you know, it's, a, it's a, almost like a kabuki theater. It's, it's ritualized struggle. And here we are <laughs> right back again. Uh, we've not really learned our lessons. And when you, when you, when you um, go up to Albany to lobby for something. Do you really spend a lot of time with individuals, or is it all with the leadership and the and the governors? Well, it, it depends. I mean, you you know, when I started out, it was uh, I was a young guy uh, going office to office yeah. and learning the importance of legislative staff. Uh, you, mm. If you didn't know who you were, you couldn't always get in to see the, the elected official. But you'd bring your issues to legislative staff. You would brief them. Uh, and, and what I found, frankly, in those days was that on the merits, <laughs> you could actually get people to listen. If you had something important uh, and you could make your case, there were people who would listen. 
Um, I think it's gotten more complicated for people who uh, don't make large contributions or don't come from powerful constituencies. But uh, you can still find people up in Albany who really care. <laughs> Uh, the elected official body in Albany is, you know, sent out probably the wrong signals to a lot of people at this point. But I think lobbying is an essential component of democracy. I'd it's reckon. a very important part of it, yeah. I think, yeah. Not only, I mean, first of all, because po politicians are so sensitive to what their communities think and what, how they're going to get reelected. I was just thinking about that, uh, reading about uh, what's happening in Arizona and how um, the senator is is being pushed to the le the right by this. What's his name? The, uh, yeah, the I, broadcaster. I forget right. what his name is, but it's just an incredible thing to me that one survival. Or look at Pennsylvania, <laughs> where one survival as being reelected becomes paramount to everything. Well, you know, it, it, it's funny, and, and I'm kind of mixed minds about it. Yeah. On the one hand, you actually want people to be responsive to political pressure and political discourse. They should be able to change their mind. But I, I think that the key word is survival. I, I kind of look like it as, as the fighter. There are certain fighters who get in the ring to win. There are other kind of journeyman fighters who get in the ring to, I want to do my time and get out of here with my head still on my shoulders and survive. Uh, with certain elected officials, survival becomes the most important thing. And what we find is they're not willing to, to stand out on an issue. They're not willing to take the chance and run against the tide. And you know, you look at McCain, love him or hate him, he built his reputation as kind of the, the guy who went against the mainstream, right. the tide was willing to, he's a Republican who was pro-immigration. Right. Right? And now he's having to find ways Campaign to articulate, <laughs> right, find ways to articulate the counter message. Yeah. Uh, it's not a pretty uh, I, picture. I mean, we, we miss principle. There doesn't seem to be any principle. Right. I, I, but look, you know, I remember many, many years ago, it was a congressman in the Bronx. I was a night student. I'd just come out of uh, my active duty service. I went to lobby Congressman Biaggi on, on the Vietnam He's War. He's incidentally in the hospital, right. I heard. Yes, I heard. Yeah. And, you know, and this is a very He's decent guy. He's 90 years old, right? Uh, he was very committed to what he did, and he, we walk in his office, he look, took one look at us, 20-year-old with attitude, <laughs> and he basically said, look, guys, you know, this is where it's at. My primary job is to get reelected. Uh, <laughs> and I, at the moment, I thought that, that was terrible. Uh, in hindsight, it was, it was rather refreshing to... <laughs> <laughs> to be so honest. To be so well, honest. Well, we always, when we talk about sco scoundrels, right. we're always amused with them. Right. And, he, he, and he was not <laughs> indifferent to the impacts of no. the war, but he knew his constituency yeah. was. Yeah. It, that was a lower middle class, working class district that everybody knew somebody who was there. Uh, he had to be careful. You did some lobbying for campaign finance. I did some lobbying Before. for campaign finance. So now, what do we think about this latest Supreme Court decision? Um, well, uh, you know, I've always been conflicted about campaign finance. Um, on the one hand, there's so much money in the game, it distorts Everything. the whole process. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, I've always been uncomfortable telling individuals what they can do with their money. Uh, and I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that this particular thing is more problematic in that it, it leans on an old view of treating corporations as individuals, which I don't think is appropriate to begin with. Uh, and it's going to throw in hundreds of millions of dollars more into elections. Uh, and this question, which I thought was raised by some of the Democrats, of what, what's going to happen with foreign corporations who have American-based subsidiaries? Are they now going to be able to distort the process. So it raises a lot of issues. But I've always felt unions uh, should be exempted from some of the campaign finance restrictions that corporations should be under, because they are, in fact, membership organizations. And the whole idea that's, was that's that we would point. get together as working people, pool our resources, and try to make a statement. Um, I'm not opposed to you know individual citizens forming their own organizations. Uh, pooling their resources in political action committees and going forward. Corporations, though, are enormously Im wealthy and powerful already. Uh, they should, I feel, in some ways be restricted in that way. But what we should do in terms of free association of individuals, I've always had problems with some of the campaign finance restrictions. Yeah, It's hard, though, because the political action committee is a political action committee. So if it's a people making three million dollars or people making, you know, 35,000. It's hard unless you put an income limit or something on it. Well, you, you, I mean, you, you, maybe you could, but, you know, th in this country, we don't 
resent, uh, at least we're not supposed to, the f people's success. Uh, you shouldn't be less free because you've been successful in life. Uh, so we ha you know, th it's not easy here to come to terms but with that. But we believe meantime, in, in taxing the people who are more successful. Well, we used to. <laughs> we <laughs> well, used hopefully to. will eventually. I was looking at it. You know, in the Eisenhower administration, the wealthy, after a certain number, would tax 90 cents on a dollar, and the country was doing fine. Uh, now in New York State, a guy making 15000 a year is paying the same rate as someone who's making $15 million a year. Uh, they cap it. Uh, it's not fair. So, so how do you go about changing something like that? One vote at a time. Uh, I, I, you know, look, I, I, I think that there's always been a group in this state that's paid attention to campaign finance and its impacts. Uh, groups like Citizen Action, some of the unions, uh, Common Cause and others, they look at the legislative process. Uh, it's not like we don't know w what's wrong there. Uh, but the legislature will not reform itself. Uh, we're always nervous on the labor side about constitutional conventions because one, they're constructed on the same body politic that we're trying to reform and there are certain protections for the poor and for pensions in the Constitution that no one wants changed, but I don't think we get change unless we rewrite the state constitution. I, but what about what I was talking about basically were taxes. Well, How many members of the legislature do you think really understand it? Well, I think that uh, many people understand it, but we've lost kind of the ideological discussion in this country on taxes. Uh, you, you say to your average person, I'm not talking about your wealthy person, uh, we're going to increase taxes on the wealthy, they hear it as you're going to increase taxes on me. Uh, and they're very distrustful. And in that sense, the more conservative elements in the country have been very successful in having a no tax, no tax, no tax kind of uh, mentality uh, take hold. Uh, I think people are willing to pay taxes when you were in a council and we wanted to do a surtax to deal with public safety. People understood it. They supported it. Uh, it was also guaranteed to be for a finite period of time. We more or less kept that commitment. Uh, if people understand what the taxes are for uh, and we can justify it, I think we can make the case. What they don't like uh, is increasing the, uh, clearly the tax rates on income, uh, the marginal rates. Uh, but to add a particular tax, people seem to be more I'm, willing to support. I was talking about readjusting the, the, the taxes on income. Uh, I think it's going to have to, more. I think we're going to have to run on it. Who does that? Uh, well, Who starts that? I think it's going to have to be a candidate for a governor. Uh, running right. statewide, um, who says the, it is ungovernable the way it is, and we have commitments we have to keep, uh, and they're going to have to try to win an election on that basis. Until somebody does that, uh, most of the legislative body is going to say, we can't do it. There's no mandate to do it. So we should go after the candidates for governor? We absolutely, it should be made an issue in every That's gubernatorial forum. How are you going to financially manage this state? And we need to shift the discussion from higher taxes to financial management. And wh what are you going to do to preserve the things that we really care about? How, how do we get people to vote? I mean, I, that, I think, is the worst thing. Is You look at the New York City Council, the average vote in a council district is very low. Average vote is very low. How do we, ha I mean, they must be low in assembly districts and state senate districts or we wouldn't have some of the people well, we have. Well, one of the arguments for term limits was in fact I that it would that. increase voter participation because uh, incumbent politicians of any party, if you really think about it, they get elected by a cons constituency. They don't really want to alter it. Yeah. So they're not looking to add new voters and they're not looking to change the mix. Right. So uh, if you have competitive districts, you get a better turnout. In that sense, uh, term limits was somewhat helpful, uh, and maybe we have to take another look at it. Uh, certainly in Albany, uh, if we can't get a constitutional convention that's going to make some basic changes, uh, I know Common Cause is looking for allies now on some kind of term limits fight. It's interesting because the term limits got such a bad name in New York when the mayor decided to just override the whole thing. Right? I was not a big term limits fan on legislative bodies and, and never have been, but something has to be done. I, w I actually voted for term limits right. because uh, I just thought they'll never get rid of the people in this council. They were there for ever, forever. Yeah, it, was a, it, it seemed like a job for life, yeah. which it shouldn't and, be. Yeah. Although, you know, in an odd but way... But I don't think the system we have now is a very right. good one. Right. I, I, I don't yeah. think so either. And I was confused by 
you know, the, we were approached when I, I was in my last uh, position at, at the Labor Council, I was approached about the question of term limits. And I said, if it goes back to the voters, I, I'll continue to oppose term limits, but it has to go back to the voters. I, I didn't think it was appropriate to do it no, legislatively. It was terrible, wasn't? Well, the voters were very clear twice yes. about what they wanted. Uh, and they were very clear, I think, in the election also. Yeah. Yeah, yeah very It's not a forgivable thing. No, it wasn't. <laughs> and it's, there's probably some lingering effects yeah. to it. You know, but we also, you know, we came a year after a presidential election where there was great hope, um, a, a huge turnouts. Uh, and the next year, that next election, the, the whole atmosphere in this city and elsewhere was very, very different. Uh, there was a certain element of despair that set in. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure going forward uh, what the impacts are going to be. What about the labor movement and the Tea Party movement? Well, you better pay attention to the Tea Party movement. Um, and, it, you know, there's some overlap there. You go into the Midwest where people have lost their jobs. And, you know, he, here's where it goes back. The Democrats come into power a year ago. For a lot of union members uh, in old industrial unions, industrial towns, who are fairly conservative and moderate people, um, they voted Democratic in the hope that the Democrats were going to come in and do what they saw Ronald Reagan did in 1980, go in and punch the other guy in the nose and get something done. And now they've been offered process. Um, and process for them is for sausage. They don't like it. They don't want to see it. They want results. And I think there's a certain element of real um, disgust setting in in the middle class and in the working class of this country. And the Tea Party movement is just giving expression to anger. If you go online and you Google Tea Party, you get about 30, 40 different groups yeah, that claim the title, and they run from people who are just angry about taxes to all the way over to ideological fascists uh, and everything in between. Uh, there's a lot of good people who are going to get involved in the Tea Party movement. Mm -hmm. You know, we ignored this um, during the Carter years, uh, these kinds of movements. Mm -hmm. They were religious-based at that point, and a lot of progressive and liberal people didn't take it seriously. Y you ignore these movements at your own peril. I w it was very interesting at their convention because they were using Saul Alinsky type organizing tactics. They were teaching their people there yes. how to go and organize. Well, it was fascinating. Know, it goes to show you, you know, values yeah. count. Yeah. Uh, it's not a question of organization and technique. It's a question of ideology yeah. and politics. Right. And they will use our tactics. Yeah. And, and get it. Uh, what's the difference between the middle class and working people? Well, I, w I would describe it this way. I, I usually use the term working middle class. Uh, over a period of 100 years, largely with organized labor and with public policy, uh, workers attained a certain standard that they could own a home, uh, have health care, certain benefits that accumulate a pension and, and Social Security. This is what the New yeah. Deal did for people. Right. Uh, and they s defined themselves as middle class. My mother was a eight hours a day on her feet supermarket checker. If you called her working class, she looked at you uh, right. askance. Like, what are you kidding? I'm a middle class person. Uh, I think that's true for a lot of working people. But there's also that strata now of professionals, everything from doctors, nurses, teachers, who see themselves as solidly middle class. Doctors used to consider themselves among the wealthy. Right. You come out of college $400,000 in debt, uh, it changes your view of where you are. Um, so it's a range. Uh, but it's almost, to me, uh, the working middle class is most working people in this country. Are at any job. At any job. That's, I agree with you, but I don't think that that's so commonly held as an interpretation. Well, the code word for working class in a town like New York is you're an immigrant. You know, oh, that's interesting. You know, yeah. you're, you're not there yet. Um, uh -huh. uh, and then I think depending on how, what assimilation forms take, uh, different groups see themselves as middle class. Certainly some of the Asian and South Asian migration that's come here even in the last 10 years right. do not see themselves as working class. Right. Uh, you know, it's interesting, uh, even in the taxi industry, taxi workers see themselves as financially independent and that some of the fights they've had with the city are over control of the routes. We don't want to be followed by GPS. It's competitive. Uh, that industry is 75, 80 percent Muslim. They believe in economic self-sufficiency. It's part of their culture. Uh, that job appeals to them on a whole different level than just a paycheck. Uh, they own the cabs, so that's the goal. Exactly right. It's yeah. a business, right? Um, and it, it fits their whole belief system. So we have to learn to respect that. There are subtleties in this. 
Uh, but look, the working class in this city runs the service industry. They also perform the work that allow middle class people to work. You know, after the women's movement begins to drive new uh, discussion in this country, we basically have set up an economy that you, you need two incomes to live almost if you're raising a family. It created a whole new pressure. Domestic workers no longer work for super wealthy people. They, they're the people that do the things that allow middle class people, people to have jobs. Work. So they're a key part of the economic structure. And as the population ages, they're also the people who take, take care, care of the, the elderly. Older people. Exactly right. Yeah. And in that sense, they're fully integrated into the economy, an essential component of it, and yet they have no protection in labor law. They're the people that work in isolation. They're not covered by any wage laws, any protections, any health and safety protections. So, you know, that's why the domestic workers are up in Albany now so trying to make their case. So we have domestic workers and then we have the taxi cab Taxi What's care, the, considered the contracts. The taxi, taxi Workers Alliance. Alliance. And who else is trying to organize people like that? Well, um, there, there's a restaurant opportunity center in New York, which is right. doing a lot of work, largely with immigrants, not exclusively, who work in the backsides of the restaurant industry in the kitchens, training people for the front and trying to advance them. And then there's unions, like everything from the hotel unions to the, what's left of the garment workers unions here, who deal largely with uh, immigrants of all stripes from all over the world, uh, trying to advance them. So we've come to the end of this discussion. Oh, that was quick. <laughs> you <laughs> said before you should be the, um, di what was it, the distinguished? Uh, distinguished practitioner. Practitioner. As opposed to a distinguished right. lecturer. Yeah, well, right? uh, but you do, when you lecture, uh, you do I do teach. <laughs> I, I, I do teach, and um, I'm not afraid to lecture, but. Uh, <laughs> and you'll be committed to labor uh, and to the working people for the rest of you? Absolutely, yeah. and that's why I'm so happy to be at City University. Yeah. Uh, it is the Great. working class university, and we've got a long history. But it's also middle class. It's very middle class. <laughs> it is the ticket to the middle class. Yeah. Thanks, Ed. Thanks for being here. <laughs>